Hi, fellow believers in Christ. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about what I've been going through lately and learning from the Lord. And it kind of started in January when a pastor was praying with me over the phone and he prayed for my healing. And he also prayed that my computer would be healed. And it was a different computer than the one I have now, but it did get 100% miraculously healed. But then later on, the Lord showed me that I really do need to get a new computer. <laughs> and and um, so then the Lord caused me to get a, this this computer that I have now, which was only one hundred and eighty dollars. And that was just such a blessing. And it's a, it's a wonderful computer. And now I can actually do more. It's easier to use and it's not noisy. Um so it, you know, it's, it's silent, which is really nice. And um, anyway, so this is a huge blessing, but, but when he, when the pastor prayed for that computer, that computer really got healed. It was, it was amazing, but it still was noisy because that computer was always noisy from the, the big, when I first bought it, it was always a noisy computer. So anyway, um, but when he was praying for me, he prophesied over me that, um, that this year, the Lord was going to show me the love of the father. And when he said that it was, he didn't know that I never had an earthly father. I, I never knew my father. And, um, and so that caused me a lot of a damage growing up. Plus the parents I did have weren't really good parents. And so um, it, it caused me a lot of damage and I, I've been born again for a few years, but um, but I still have never really understood the love of the Father like I should. And um, so anyway, I just kind of, I, I kept remembering that that was prophesied over me, but I, you know, was kind of like on the back burner of my mind because what am I going to do? You know, I just have to wait on the Lord, I guess. But recently, um, in the last few weeks, I've been really seeking the answer from the Lord and really praying about understanding the Father's love better. And um, just in the last week, um, the Lord's been answering that prayer. He's beginning to show me some things that I needed to see. So I'll start out with a few days ago. I had a dream that I was on the phone, like on my cell phone with talking to my, my father, you know, like an earthly father, even though in real life, I never had a father. I was on the cell phone talking to my father and I was telling him how I had been in a sinful relationship and I, and it was, I ended it and it, and it was over. And so I expected my father to be happy, you know, that it was over and be like, oh, great. I'm so glad you ended that. But instead of him being happy, he was really mad, really mad at me. And he he was more focused on the fact that I had gotten into the relationship in the first place. And he was really upset at me. And he was angry, like in a loving way, like a concerned parent would be angry, angry with you. And he was just kind of going ballistic and saying, you know, how could you do that? You you um, you know, you you um, separated yourself from the Lord and you put your salvation in jeopardy and and now you're going to have to get rid of, you know, all this baggage in your life and all this kind of stuff. And he was so focused on the negative. And when I was in the dream, I was thinking, boy, I'm really sorry. I told him, you know, I was thinking to myself, I shouldn't have said anything. I should have just kept it all to myself. And um, I don't remember if we hung up in the dream or not, but I remember feeling very uncomfortable listening to him yell at me over the phone. Well, when I woke up, the Lord showed me that that dream was my first experience having a father and him being my father. And actually it was, it was the Lord in the dream. He was the one I was talking to on the phone. And so in real life, I have never had any parent get mad at me because I sinned or be upset, you know, because my for my spiritual state, you know, no parent has ever cared about me that way or felt that way about me. Like they would be concerned and upset if I did something wrong. 
So that was the first experience of my whole life with a concerned, upset parent. Now, I got in trouble a lot when I was growing up, but it wasn't for doing bad things. It was for having normal needs of a child. Like if I said I'm hungry or if I said I was hurting or if I cried openly or if I asked a question, those were the things that I got in trouble for. But I never got in trouble for sinning. (laughs) Okay, so in this dream, I was in trouble for sinning. Well, anyway, um, that was the first experience of my life with a parent who cared about my spiritual state. And that parent was actually God, the father in showing up in my dream. And he showed me that when I woke up. So so after I realized what the dream was about, I was like, oh, this is the beginning of our relationship. Too bad it got off on a rocky start, but at least it's a beginning, you know. (laughs) And so I was really happy. So I've been happy, very happy about that dream. And I don't ever want to disappoint the Lord again or make him upset about things that I do. So I don't ever, ever want to sin again. Um, None of us are perfect, but I don't ever want to willfully sin. And when I do make a mistake or do something wrong, I want to repent of it and make amends, you know, and not do that anymore. So um, but anyway, um, the the father and I are beginning our relationship. So then last night. So this is several nights later. Last night, I had another dream right before I woke up. Now, the dream that I was having was actually kind of like a from the devil. It was like one of those dreams where you're going to do something bad or whatever. And it hadn't really gotten going yet. It was like the beginning of a bad dream. But all of a sudden, there was a flash that ended the dream. And it was another dream, like another dream flashed and interrupted the bad dream. And then I woke up immediately. And the flash was, I saw an email come to me. And all it had was the subject line, G4 colon 17. And so I I thought, well, that's um, when I woke up, I I was like, God just sent me an email and it's Genesis 4 17. (laughs) So I looked up, um, I I was all excited and I looked up, I got up and I looked up Genesis 4, 17. God's never sent me an email before, you know, but I knew it was from him. Well, Genesis 4, 17 is the verse that has to do with Cain having a son named Enoch. (laughs) And then he, he built a city and named it after his son. Well, I was like, okay, that can't be for me. That has nothing to do with me. I mean, Cain was a, was a murderer. And he had a son and Enoch, his son, Enoch, this is not the Enoch that walked with God. This is a different Enoch. Um, it's this Enoch is just a regular guy who never did anything for the Lord. And so this is a base, basically a verse about sinners living carnal lives, you know, building a city and all this kind of stuff. And what does this have to do with my spiritual life? And so I was kind of down for a minute and I was thinking, is there any other uh, Bible book that starts with G? So I looked in the contents of the Bible and sure enough, there's Galatians. So, and I hadn't been thinking about that originally, you know, initially I just thought Genesis 4.17, but it's actually Galatians 4.17. So I'm looking it up here. And this also doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but at least it deals with a Christian life, which is my life. So I knew this must be it. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. And this is talking about, I I don't know if it's talking about non-Christians or if it's talking, I think it's talking about about people who are not born again. Um, They make much of you, the church in Galatians, but not for a good purpose. Um, They want to shut you out of salvation so that you will make much of them. And it's where um, I believe Paul is talking to the church in Galatians and he's telling them not to fall into religion. Don't be like these religious people um, that want you to be like them. So so then I thought, well, you know, I've never wanted to practice religion. So since I became born again, I've always been very anti-religion. So I'm not really sure how this first what the Lord's trying to tell me. So I started reading at the beginning of the chapter to try to figure it out better. So here it is at the beginning of the chapter, Galatians chapter four. 
I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father when he's you know, at the right age to inherit. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Um, so that's like before we became born again, we were enslaved to religion. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now that would include daughters. So I'm an adopted daughter of father of God. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, now that prophecy over me had to do with me learning the love of the Father, experiencing the love of the Father. And so here is Abba, Father, which they always taught me in church means Abba means daddy. So I looked it up online on whether what Abba really means. And some people say it means daddy. Some people say it doesn't mean daddy. But the thing is, this is what it really means, whether it means daddy or not. It means my father. OK, so that's different from father, because any man can be a father to to whoever they're a father to. And and the, and God in heaven is a father to many. But when you say Abba, father, what you're saying is my father. And that's why a lot of people say it means daddy is because you would only call or dad you would only call your own father dad. You don't call your neighbor's father dad, okay? So even if it doesn't literally mean dad, the idea that it refers to dad is true because it refers to your own personal father. So when Jesus cried, Abba, Father, he was crying, my father, you know, personally saying, you know, father of me, not, not somebody else's father. And this is really crucial and, and this was like a big lightning bolt to me because it showed me that the same Abba Father of Jesus is also the Abba Father of me, meaning he's not the Father to me. He is my Father to me. And I in my whole life, I've always thought of him as the Father of Jesus and the Father and maybe our Heavenly Father but I never thought of him before as my personal father. And so this, this really, this is definitely from the Lord. That email was from the Lord. And this is from, this is from the Lord. This is part of my journey in learning my identity, my identity as a daughter of the father. So verse seven, so you are no longer a slave, but a son or daughter. And if a son, then an heir through God. So I am no longer a slave um, in practicing religion or practicing works of the flesh, you know, sin, but I am now an heir. I am a daughter of my father. He's not just any old father. He's my father, my personal father in heaven. And then verse eight, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods, meaning the demons. When you didn't know God, you were enslaved to demons. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? And he's telling the, Galati the church in Galatians that you guys are getting back into, into slavery because you're, you're falling back into religion, which is also a work of the flesh, just like sin is. He might also be talking to them about sin, too. I'm not sure. And then it says in verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. That's religion. OK, I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So he, Paul is saying, I'm afraid that I taught you the gospel in vain because you didn't hear it, because now you're going back to practicing religion. You're you're being Pharisees. You're practicing the circumcision is what he's talking about. And and so then he goes on in verse 12 and says, brothers, I entreat you become as I am. For I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. 
you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. So he somehow Paul came to them because Paul was sick. Maybe he wasn't able to travel further and go to a different place. So he ended up preaching the gospel in Galatia. Maybe that's what he's talking about. And though my condition was a trial to you because they probably had to nurse Paul back to health, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. So so they they treated Paul with so much sincere love and tenderness and affection. They would have given him their own eyes, you know, Um, they and and he came to them only because of infirmity, only because he was sick or something. That was the only reason he came to them. But he ended up preaching them the gospel. They became Christians. But now he's he's upset because now they're slipping back into religion. Um, So verse 15, what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, oh wait, I already said that. Verse 16, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Meaning, are you now against me? Now that I've preached the gospel, you've turned on the gospel. So am I your enemy? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. So I think this means they, the religious groups, are 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 talking you up, but not for a good purpose. They're talking you up because you're following them. Um, it is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So now he feels like he has to give birth to them again. He already gave birth them once when he first taught them the gospel and they got saved but now he feels like they need to be saved again um verse 20 i wish i could be present with you now and change my tone for i am perplexed about you now this is the part that relates to me too as well down here in verse 21 tell me you who desire to be under the law do you not listen to the law Um, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. So um, when Abraham had sex with Hagar, it was carnal because his wife told him to do it so that they could have a son because because she didn't believe that the Lord would give her a son. But but the holy um, like the word of the Lord was that his wife, Sarah, would have a son. So anyway, um, while the son of the free woman was born through promise, because God promised Sarah a son, he didn't promise Hagar a son. Okay, now verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now in Mount Sinai, that's where Moses gave the law. Okay, and that's what Hagar represents. She represents um, following, um, religious works so that, you know, you can, um, get forgiveness after you sin because you, then you, then you do a sacrifice. You don't live, um, in freedom from sin. You, you, you live in bondage to sin and you have to keep giving these sacrifices. Verse 25. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, which also lives in religion for she is in slavery with her children. They're in slavery to religion, um, practicing the circumcision and all that, and following the days and everything. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above, the Jerusalem in the spirit, meaning born again people are free, and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, just as Sarah did not bear, but she could rejoice. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one, Sarah, will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So Sarah did have a husband, but she didn't have any children, you know, but, but her child, Isaac was greater than Hagar's child because her child was the child of promise. Verse 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise, but just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. Religious people will always persecute those who walk in the spirit, those who are born again. Verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. 
for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So religious people will not inherit the kingdom of God along with born again people. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. When we're born again, we are, we're, we're free from the bondage of religious slavery. Um, so this kind of relates to me in two ways. Number one, this, this chapter taught me, first of all, that the Lord in heaven is my personal Abba father, meaning my personal dad. He's not just a nebulous father in heaven. And I also learned from this that the father in heaven is only father to born again people. He's not father to religious people or, or people who commit sin. He's not He's not the heavenly father of everyone on earth. He's only the heavenly father of those who are born again. Isn't that interesting? Um, but also, and so that's why we need to remain in the spirit remain in the born again life and don't go back to religion or sin because then we don't have that Abba father isn't our father anymore. So um, let's see. Only heirs of salvation have the spirit of Jesus, which cries Abba father, who is my personal father. So um, basically the big news of the day is I have a father a personal father. He's not just my whole life. I thought, and it's because I'm born again. It's not because I'm special in any way or better than anybody else. It's because I'm born again and all born again. People are sons and daughters of their own personal Abba father, um, their own personal dad in heaven. And it's not somebody else's dad. It's, it's our dad. And that's why Jesus said, pray our father who art in heaven. But not everyone can pray that. He taught the disciples to pray that because the disciples were on their, were going to be born again and they were going to be apostles. And they, they would have a reason to pray that. But if, if a person's in sin or religion, they don't really have a reason to pray our father who art in heaven because they're, that father is not theirs. Jesus said in the scripture that those who practice sin and those who lie, their father is actually the devil, Satan. So you can't, you're, you will always have a father. It's either going to be Satan or the Lord, but you're only going to, the Lord will only be your, your personal father if you're obeying him and you're walking in the spirit. But it's just really a beautiful thing because those of us who are born again, when we're not praying as a group, and saying, our Father who art in heaven, when we pray individually, like in our prayer closet, we can say, my Father who art in heaven. And that's what I'm going to be saying from now on, because now I finally realize that is my Father. It's not just the Father of Jesus. It's not just the Father of everybody on the planet. It's not just the Father of born-again people as a whole. But He is my personal Dad. And this, this is just a massive revelation for me. And so in the next video, I'm going to share some more stuff with you, but I need to read the Bible a lot. I know what verses the Lord wants me to read, but I need to read them first and meditate on them and see what the Lord teaches me. And then I'll share that with you in the next video. Um, but this is just, I can't express what a revelation this is for me. Um, you know, and, and him getting mad at me on the phone in that dream, um, that was a beautiful, beautiful experience for me. It was so beautiful. I, I just, because no one has ever been like that with me before. And, um, and now I know he is my personal dad. He's my personal dad. So when I sin, I am personally upsetting him in a personal way. So I'm not, I don't want to sin anymore. <laughs> I don't want him to be upset. I want us to have good times together, you know, but he is my personal dad. So anyway, I can't wait to share the next video with you, but I need to, um, I won't be ready to share it until, until the Lord has taught me what I need to learn. Okay. God bless you.